Hallelujah. I'm going to read out of Isaiah 59. As for me, says the Lord, this is my covenant with them. My spirit is upon you. My words which I have put in your mouth shall not depart from your mouth, nor from the mouth of your descendants, nor from the mouth of your descendants' descendants, says the Lord, from this time and forevermore. Say, well, that's me. Chapter 60 says, Arise, shine, for your light has come. The glory of the Lord is risen upon you. For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth and deep darkness of people. But the Lord will arise over you and his glory will seen upon you. The Gentiles shall come into your light and the kings to the brightness of your rising. Lift up your eyes all around and see. They all gather together. They come to you. Your sons shall come from afar and your daughters shall be nursed at your side. Then you shall see and become radiant and your heart shall swell with joy because the abundance of the sea shall be turned to you. The wealth of the Gentiles shall come to you. Well, that's prophetic. And you can say, well, I don't know, I'm not into prophecy. He says he's put it in your mouth and it's for the descendants, descendants, descendants. Say, it's me. And it's after the Gentiles come in and we, we, I was a Gentile. I wasn't a Jew that I'm aware of. And I've come in, so that's for me. Say, it's for me. We arise and shine. (laughs) Not arise and look gloomy, but arise and shine. That last song we just sang about the blood, I tell you what, that, that, that song ministers, it speaks. You may deal with things a hundred times during the day where the enemy attacks, comes against you, tries to mess up your plans, tries to mess up what God has for you. It's a real simple answer. A lot of Christians get down in the dirt and try to fight the enemy. That's really actually not what Scripture tells us to do. If we actually uh, look at it this way, I always like, I don't know, castles, kings, stories about them, knights fighting for kings. That was, I don't that makes me tick. Maybe it doesn't you, but it does me. And, and a king and a queen, they, they, they don't give attention or much attention to anybody underneath them. You know, because they're too, they're too good, right, for the, for the paupers, right? Well, the, the devil's a pauper. You're too good to engage with him. And a lot of times in life, we simply got to go, when we come up against things and the enemy is trying to come up against us, we just simply say the blood. Check out the blood. See what the blood did. The blood has covered me. Yeah, but you messed up this and that. Yeah, but the blood. Did did you notice the blood? See, the destroyer passed over the house in Egypt because of the blood. And you simply now, the doorpost is your tongue. That's the doorpost of your house. And you got to exercise your tongue and just say, the blood. I was up in Aspen <laughs> driving my black pickup that I still have with some very, very bald tires. The reason they were bald is we simply didn't have the money to put, you know, here in Colorado in about October, what do you do? We all know. What, what do we do? You put on a fresh set of tires so it lasts you the winter, right? And I'm driving up and down the pass to Aspen. We didn't have any money to put to, to buy another set of tires, so I kept running the bald ones I had. And there was a shortcut up to a job site, and it went over a little hill, and it had snowed that day, and I kind of knew it, and I had gotten used to kind of babying the truck, and, and I don't know, I knew the truck and knew all of the ins and outs of it and knew exactly what my tires could do and what it couldn't do. It was surprising what four-wheel drive could actually do in snow with those bald tires. And so I'm just like, yeah, well, didn't snow that much. We're going to go hit the shortcut. Well, we got, I got about three quarters up to the top of that little hill and it had snowed about six inches. It actually snowed a lot more than I had expected 
uh, from what was down in town. And I got about three quarters, maybe seven eighths of the way up there, and my truck wouldn't go any further. And I began to slide backwards. And there was a pretty steep 40, 50 foot drop off with no guardrail to the left hand side. And I'm, you know, once you slide backwards, there's really not a whole lot of control. And it's just, and I'm headed to the cliff. And the only thing I could get out was Jesus. <laughs> and my truck stops right on the edge. I, saw, I, I didn't have time to, to think a whole lot more. I simply just cried out, said, Jesus, help. Truck stops right on the very edge of the cliff. Some kind gentleman comes along, pulls me out, and I go the long way. And I'm still here today with no wreck, even when I had bald tires. I had bald tires because we chose to make God first in our lives. We chose to give to Him first. We chose to tithe. We chose to do things. Some people would have said, go buy tires. And I'm like, no, no, no. We're putting God first. He's number one in my life. And when you put Him number one in your life, I'm telling you, I'm, I'm just telling you, the name of Jesus and the blood of Jesus, they work. And they work for you. And they work for me. Hallelujah. Arise, shine, for your light has come. The glory of the Lord is risen upon you. And even though there's great darkness right now, the Lord will arise over you and His glory will be seen upon you. The, say, the glory of the Lord is seen upon me. <laughs> oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. I was meditating on the verse this last week. The Lord shall increase you more and more, you and your children. I've been listening to Dave Ramsey a lot recently. I used to not like him. Kind of like him now kind of funny you listen to them more and more and you like them more i still don't 100 percent agree with everything but i tell you what the guy's got some good stuff and um you know god has put us on this earth to be a representation of him and his abundance is here for us and he's going to bless me more and more me and my children. And the more you meditate on the verse, the more thankful you get. And we just sang a new song tonight about generations. We all, there's children here. There's grandchildren here. Generations. I, he might have pulled you out of the dunghill, but you're here to give your children the best life they can have. And not just your children, but your children's children. And it, it'll just... It'll make you weep when you think about it. I'm here not only to minister to my children, but to my children's children. I'm here to leave a legacy. I'm here to leave a legacy of God's goodness. Hallelujah. Well, thanks for coming to Church of the Word. Shake somebody's hand. Tell them uh, thanks for coming. we got some exciting things happening, and we'll get into it in a bit. Hallelujah. If everybody could take their seats. Glory to God. We'll do the announcements. Um, we have prayer uh, Monday noon. Come, we always have a good time at prayer. And then also we will have Bible study at 7. Jay and I won't be here this week. We leave tomorrow, but we will be back for Saturday. So... Um, let's do, uh, let's take up our tithes and offerings. You can turn to Luke 16. Um, this is the portion of the service that people usually aren't super excited about. And the, you know, we've got a flack for this portion of the service and it's right up there with how loud the worship music is and what do you believe about tongues and healing. It's right up there where people don't really enjoy this portion. 
of the service. I had a conversation with a lady uh, a while back. We were talking about prosperity and money and, then, and what God says about all of that. And she was like, yeah, she's like, they went to the service the other week. And the pastor spent entirely too much time on money and prosperity, just entirely too much time. And I was like, no, it wasn't here. It was somewhere else. And I was like, oh, okay. You know, I wasn't there. Okay, sure. And so I was like, whoa. So, like, who determines if you spend too much time on that? Like, like, what or who determines that? Do you, do you? Or, like, I mean, what if the pastor and all the members of the church were having a great time, and here you are, a visitor, and you just totally did that judgment? And then let's just go out on a limb and say that that's where you went to church, and you, were, you loved that church, and you were considered a member. Then do you still, do you still have that, is that still in your place to uh, call that judgment? Anyway, we moved on. Uh, we never did answer that question, and we moved on. Luke 16, moving on. I want to start at verse 10. He who is faithful in what is least is faithful also in much, and he who is unjust in what is least is unjust also in much. Therefore, if you have not been faithful in the unrighteous mammon, who will commit to your trust the true riches? And if you have not been faithful in what is another man's, who will give you what is your own? So if you look back at the beginning of the chapter, it, this is in the context of money. So a lot of people quote these verses, not necessarily in the context of money. So before that, um, it, you know, it was a certain rich man had a steward, and the steward wasn't handling the money correctly, and the rich man was doing what he needed to do. He was, um, you know, on his way to getting rid of the servant or the steward, and um, <laughs> it's really interesting because he really had no strings attached to that money that the steward was stealing. He actually complimented him at the end and said, well, for once you're doing something right. You're, you're making a way for yourself once I kick you out, once I fire you, right? So this rich man, you know, how many of us, if somebody, if we catch somebody stealing from us, are we going to be like, oh, yeah, not a big deal? I want to talk a little bit about trusting God with your finances. So according to these verses here in 10, he is putting money in the context, or he is putting this, he who is faithful in much, and he who is unjust in what is least is unjust also and in much. Therefore, if you have not been faithful in the unrighteous mammon, who would commit to your trust the true riches? In other words, he's saying money is the least of all of this, and if you can't be faithful and trust God with your money, you're not God can't trust you with other things. And, you know, a lot of times people want to, oh, I want to have faith for my healing. I want to have faith for this. And I want to have, you know, I want to trust the Lord in this area of my life. And, but they, they, they haven't even trusted God with their finances. I was listening to Andrew Womack to, or this week, and he was saying that they have this healing conference every year. And he's like, you know, people come and, you know, he encourages them to come and, like, get healed and stuff. And he's like, and then, you know, they're, they're believing for big things like cancer to be healed and blind eyes to be opened. And he's like, and then they, you pass the offering bucket, bucket and they don't even put anything in. God is saying here in these verses that if you can't trust him with your finances, do I say this? Why, why do you think that you're going to get anything? Why do you think you're going to get your questions answered? Why do you think you're going to... God wants you to be faithful and to trust him with your finances because that is the least of everything. 
then we can move on to other things. And a lot of times it's the other way around. One, I remember years and years ago, um, a leader told Jay and I, he said, well, don't ever trust somebody that doesn't tithe. Because he said, they're not trusting God with their finances. And he's like, they're not trustworthy. You shouldn't trust them. At the time, it kind of hit me in the gut. And still, when I say it out loud, it hits me in the gut because there's a lot of um, people that I love and that I have close relationship with that don't tithe. If I haven't trusted God with my finances, I'm deceiving myself to think I'm trusting God in other areas of my life. It starts with your money, folks. Verse 11, where it says, who will commit to you the true riches? It's implying that money is not the true riches. Money is just a tool. So when you view it as that, and God gave me that tool, so God can get me the tool, like, if I, if I put God first, seek ye first the kingdom of God, if I, give him, if I give him first in my life and I trust him with my finances, he will take care of me and I will be blessed in it. Just like the bald tires. God will take care of you. Okay, well, that's all I have. I did, um, Lee's not here, so we didn't get the buckets out. Do you want to go get the buckets real fast? Apparently. Oh, he's got them. Oh, well, let's stand up. If anybody needs an envelope, raise your hand. Let's pray over these off this offering. So, Father, we give you glory and praise right now, and we determine in our hearts that we will put you first and that we will be faithful and trust you in the very least in our money and then you will be faithful and we can trust you in other areas of our lives and you will be faithful to take care of us in the name of Jesus amen hallelujah is he worthy of it all when you're in the grave gray and cold, looking up at the top of your casket, and you realize you can't take a thing out of this world, is he worthy of it all? <laughs> is he worthy of the tithe? Is he worthy? Oh, I'll just use this tonight. Um, we have a testimony this last week. Somebody pulled into our drive, and they're like, why don't you have a garage door? We're like, well, we kind of, you know, Put the money elsewhere <laughs> for now. <laughs> we just had other places to go with the money. And they're like, well, that's not right. You need a garage door. Uh, we'll pay half. And I'm like, okay, time out before you make too many commitments. Uh, you got to understand the reason we don't have the garage door is because we really want an expensive garage door. Like, like it's the latest, greatest powder coated painted it's got the right the you know that's there there is why we waited is it is expensive they're like oh we don't care doesn't matter we're gonna pay for half and i'm just like glory to god i guess we can order a garage store <laughs> but this is these are the things that happen um that when you put god first god takes care of you takes care of you and be like, well, pastor doesn't really need any money. He's got businesses and he makes plenty of money. That's completely beside the point. Because needs, God will be get, get over needs to you that are always bigger than you. If you're following God, he'll give you, I don't care if you're a millionaire, you'll have a $1.5 million need. If you're a billionaire, you'll have a $1.5 billion need. Your needs just get bigger. Your vision gets bigger. Your needs get bigger. And there'll still be something to sow into. It never stops, Marlon. 
You know, uh, Kim and I thought that after we believed God for our what first vehicle was a white Tahoe, and we believed God for that, we thought we were done for a while and didn't realize that that was just the beginning. We're constantly believing him for things that he can provide for. In the meantime, we don't complain. We don't go around mumbling and grumbling and complaining about things in our life and how awful it is and how terrible it is. No, no, we thank him for what we have. We thank him for what he's given. And a lot of time, a lot of times your faith is developed in the patience that it takes to wait for things to come. And and uh, so that's that's often how it works. And we need to get on board with that seed time harvest. And, and a lot of times the time is a little longer and we want it to be. Well, the reason is, is we need to develop in our patience. We need to develop in our faith walk and what we're believing for. And a lot of times we got to develop in what we're saying. And uh, last couple of weeks we've been talking specifically on speaking. So tonight, let's, let's go to Mark chapter 11. We're going to start there, I think. Start in Mark chapter 11. Well, I'm going to read in Proverbs before that, but you go to Mark chapter 11. I'll, I'll go to Proverbs chapter 18, verse 20. It says this, verse 20 and 21, a man's stomach, or really what this means uh, in the Hebrew is your innermost being, or you could call it soul, your, your soul, a man's soul shall be satisfied from the fruit of his mouth. A man's soul, mind, will, emotions, their well-being, shall be satisfied from the fruit of his mouth. Why do you think God is against, so, so against murmuring and complaining? I mean, you read the Old Testament, the children of Israel, they murmured and complained continually, right? And it would make God angry. He provided for them every day. They get manna, fresh manna every single day. Uh, it, it's, it was like the dew on the grass. All you had to do is go out and you wanted breakfast. You just go out early in the morning before the sun hit it. And it was kind of like a frost. And you just picked it up off the ground, took it back to your tent and ate it. I mean, that sounds like a pretty good deal, doesn't it? No dishes. No, no going to Walmart. No shopping. You don't have to, you don't have to do anything other than go out and gather it. And, and it wasn't that long they start murmuring and complaining. Well, we want meat, right? Because it was something they didn't have. See, every time you murmur and complain, it's always for things you don't have, right? Or maybe it's something you're tired of. But, but the bottom line is, is God knows this principle, and so you end up working against what God has for you because here he says a man's innermost being shall be satisfied. You want to get satisfied in life, get thankful. You want to get satisfied in life, be continually thankful. And then when you're continually thankful for what you have, God will get you more. God will get, God's not against blessing his, his children. He's not against getting people stuff, but, he's, but you're not going to get things murmuring and complaining. A lot of times murmuring and complaining is actually the root cause of it is actually jealousy. I remember um, soon after uh, we have a story, a testimony of how we got our house. Marlon A., you were with us step for step on some of that. Um, on, on us being obedient and stepping out, we were living in Olathe. We had rented for over 10 years, and uh, we had a crummy house, okay? Um, if the wind blew really hard, you could feel the wind come blowing through the knot holes on the inside of the house. And on some of the coldest days, it was tough to keep the house above 70 degrees, I mean, it was just the front door was bad. Every time, because it was a rental, we'd uh, say something about getting it fixed. They, they'd come look at it and ignore it. And, and anyway, it just wouldn't get done. So um, 
we're there. I, I actually thought that we had passed the real estate boom. And, and, my, and this is, I'm just telling you the thoughts that came into my head. I get thoughts too. I get negative thoughts. I have to deal with negative thoughts. And it's like, Jay, you missed the real estate boom. If you could have just purchased the property five years earlier, just think about how much money you'd be worth now. And it just, but we, we didn't have the funds for it. A lot of the reason we didn't have the funds for it is because we became tithers. And when we put God first and tithe, we don't mean tithe 1%. When, when we say tithe, my youngest isn't here, but he just got his first paycheck this last week, and he understands what the tithe is. It's, it's not, you know, I think he made $95 and he was so happy about how much money he made. He knows it's $9.50. And then we round up because we're not being religious about it. And we want some seed in the ground. We want some offering money in the ground so that we can get a return on our offering because the tithe is just returning what's the Lord's. It's just giving back what's already his. It's not an offering. It's not putting extra seed into the ground. It's not even seed money. It's simply returning what's his. And, and he understands that because this is something we de develop. Well, at the end of the year, you look at all the money you give in tithes and you scratch your head and you're like, well, I could have paid a debt off. And in fact, I had some people counsel me saying that I'm in error because I put the tithe ahead of debt. And I shouldn't do that. And I said, no, 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 no. I'm putting God first. I don't care what in my life. And God, when it says to put the kingdom of God number one, it says number one. And if I pay debt off first, that means debt would be number one. And I've even had some people say, well, I'll tithe after I pay my debt off. The funny is they never get out of debt. They just diligently make sure they stay in debt so that then, well, then they never tithe, right? And so these things developed uh, for us, and, and so we're in this house, and it seems crummy, and it seems like we're never going to get out of it. I remember in the summer, we would every day, and I, I'm not, you can ask LeVere Soper, and, and he'll tell you, but every day we'd swat anywhere from 20 to 40 flies. We would kill them. We'd swat them, kill them, broom them up on a pile, and put them in the trash, some of them, I, I told Kim, I said, you need to flush them down the pot because I found them crawling out of the trash. And I'm like, we have to kill these things more than once. And Levere would come and stay with us, and, and he'd wear his coat at night because we just had a swamp cooler, so we couldn't regulate the house super well. So the swamp cooler ran all night. We froze that poor man. He had icicles hanging from his nostrils in the morning. And wrapped up in two or three different coats, wouldn't complain. He just went on, and then he'd, he'd grab the little swatter that we had around, and he'd wake up early in the morning to go around praying and swat flies. And that was his job. For three days, he'd kill all our flies. We had fly strips hanging in our house. Some of you ladies would be like, this is disgusting. It was. It was. That's, that's the place we lived in. And, and spring of 2020? Was it 2020? So it was pre-COVID, right? It was, it was right at COVID. Yeah, was that 2020? Okay. That spring, the Lord ministered to us about bringing a truckload of groceries out here and handing out food boxes to the town. And so uh, that was just absolutely stretched and snapped our boxes because not only we didn't have the, really the funds to do it, but the Lord said do it. So when the Lord says do it, what, what do you do? Eh, well, you know, it depends on whether I have the money to do it. Well, that's what your brain wants to think. But that's not what we did, and we put we had to pay over seven thousand dollars for that truckload of groceries, and um, uh, it was a thousand boxes of food. We paid over seven thousand dollars for it, and we put it on a credit card. You know, um, when you go into battle, you know you charge in the battle. Kind of thought that's what we're doing with our credit card. Charge. By faith. 
So we put that on a credit card, and it wasn't my credit card, but the person was willing to do it. He wanted points from Cabela's anyway, so he put it on his credit card, and we brought it out here, and I think we charged twenty dollars. We had charged twenty dollars a box, recouped all of our money, and and we counted it here in the kitchen because we we unloaded the truck over here at the the uh, Delta Rec Center, and so many people showed up that the that the the health, the Delta Health guy was in a panic because he's he kept saying he's like Jay Jay, there is too many people because everybody had to be masked and and gloved and and COVID was at its you know breakout point and he he's just like we had too many volunteers to unload we had too many people coming through the line I mean people just mobbed that truck and went through and on that truck we got rid of everything right. It just disappeared in two to three hours. We brought all the money over here, and it felt like I was a drug dealer counting all these ones and these fives, and we recouped all of our money plus had enough money for the next truck. And then we ended up, we ended up bringing three out here, right, Marlon? Well, in that midst of obeying God, again, we, we started, we stepped out with, we put the money on a credit card. Dave Ramsey would have a fit. <laughs> and, and, and we put the money on the, on the credit card, and by faith we believed him. And, and then what it ended up doing is the owner of the house that we live in right now calls me or messages me on Facebook one day because he goes, whatever you're doing with them food boxes, can we get those food boxes down to Durango? And I'm like, Durango? Well, they had moved down to Durango, and they're pastoring a church down there. And the house that we prayed in for, what was it, three years, Peggy, every Friday night, in that living room, is now the house we live in. We had no idea we were going to purchase this house. In fact, when it first came up that he wanted to sell it, we offered it to you guys. We took Marlon and they were like, we got a great house for you. We think it's just for you. Took them up there, showed them the house, and they looked at it. They're like, this house is way too much work. We're out of here. <laughs> and it was after that that it was like, ding, ding, ding. Maybe we could move into this house. Like, we seriously hadn't thought about it before. Well, then immediately the thoughts come in. Oh, no, that's not, it's not going to be possible uh, it's out of your price range. Your credit's not good enough. You know, all these things. Because we had just been recovering from a terrible credit debacle. And so our, my credit score showed I had it was wiped completely clean. So it was like I'm 18. Remember at 18, you get your dad to help you be, uh, on anything that you have because you have no credit and the bank's looking at you like you've got, uh, you got a, a, a horn sticking out of the middle of your head and some kind of unicorn because, like, we don't want to lend this 18-year-old any money because uh, he has no credit. Well, that's what I was, except I was 35, <laughs> and I had no credit. Everything had been wiped up. I had no negative on my credit, but I had no positive on our credit because we operated in cash at the time, paid for everything in cash, did everything in cash, only operated in cash. Some of that was good. And um, so I remember... Uh, it's actually uh, exactly four years ago because we had met with um, with Rick and his wife the week before we went we went into Landmark to see uh, to explore the possibilities of could we purchase this property, and when we met, Pastor Rick was like, "What can I do to help you get into this property?" He couldn't have found a better landlord that was wanting to sell to us. And so we ended up leasing with the option to purchase for two years so that we could restore some of our credit. And it ended up, we closed in a year and a half. And it took us a year and a half. And, and, and something we didn't even think was possible. Now the reason I'm telling you that story is the Lord ministered to me and he says, you have a faith story uh, of what I did in your life a lot of people don't know what you went through to get there. And, he, and, and then he told me, he said, some people will be jealous of what God did for you because of, of 
some of the, the miracle that we have. And sure enough, it, within months, just a couple months, I had a gentleman come out, and he was uh, very, very jealous, and and we're not going to go into any more of that. Uh, but but exactly what the Lord said was true. But a lot of it is I. We continued, even though we were in Olathe, um, even though we thought that we missed the boom, the real estate boom, even though it seemed like like we're never going to get out of it, we're never going to recover, we're never going to um, uh, come to a place where we own our own property. You know what? He is faithful. We continued to speak and believe that God would do something for us. And, and he did. And it was because of our obedience first that the connection was made so that it became possible. We still had a lot of hoops to jump through to get where we are now. And it's not a Jay and Kim story. Uh, it's a Jesus story because of what he did. It matters what you think and what you say so your soul is satisfied from the fruit of your mouth there was times we would continually quote and speak that we were going to have our own property we're going to have our own house but we're renting like it didn't seem possible but we continually talked about it because we believe this verse from the produce of his lips he shall be filled Death and life are in the power of the tongue, and those who love it will eat its fruit. See, if you death and life are truly in the power of your tongue. If you read James chapter 3, it tells you the awfulness about your tongue. See, the tongue, our tongue, is what steers our life. In James chapter 3, Either, either you believe that your tongue is a bridle, like you bridle a horse, or it's not. I choose to believe that that's what James chapter, chapter 3 is talking about, and that's how it is. It, he likens it to the steering of a ship. The, the rudder is a wee little rudder on the back end of that ship, and, it, and it, that ship can be a thousand feet long, and it will steer that ginormous ship to where it needs to go by that little rudder, and he likens the rudder to your tongue. I believe our tongue is the most important thing in our life. Now, now the thing that you, gets us into trouble is when circumstances happen in our, in our life, we like to discuss the circumstance. You know, I played softball for a number of years. And, uh, <clears throat> you know, it's not baseball. Baseball is actually tough to play. Baseball, they throw 80, 90 mile an hour. You got a wee little ball, and, and you try to hit that. You got to have skill. Softball, it's not that much skill involved, but you realize how often you can't make a play, and you know why? It's because it's head games. It's because of head games. And, and we had two guys at the top of our lineup. We were actually a pretty good team, had some ex-college players. And we had two guys that we put at the very top of our lineup. And when you listen to them talk, they didn't talk about not getting on base or if they're going to get on base. They talked when we get on base. Oh, we're going to get on base. In other words, the first two, they were, uh, they were short, they were super fast, and those first two would dictate how the rest of the team would bat. Because if they got on, the rest of the team, it, it was just like, I, I can't explain it to you, uh, it, it, it really, but it was like, if those two got on, the rest of the team would hit. If they don't get on, we don't hit. Because it's up here. It's, I just read this this last week. You know what separates the top five tennis players of the world from the top 25? The top five tennis players in the world from the next 20. What separates, they did a study on this. They all work hard. They, they all practice. They all have the top coaches in the world. But it's their thinking. The top five 
have a positive reaction in their thinking even when they lose a point. They're going, well, we'll get it next time. We're going to roll with it next time. The best player on our softball team, I had to have this. This was after I'm spirit-filled. I'm renewing my mind and my thinking. Because it, the, your thinking is programmed. A lot of times your thinking is programmed by the time you're eight years old. So whatever happens from zero to eight programs your thinking. And, and the, best, uh, the best player on our team, he was an outfielder, and... Um, you know, we're staying in there one day, and we're looking at the chart of, of the tournament. And I'm doing mind games. I'm going, well, this, this, this team from Denver is showing up. And uh, they were supposedly a, what you call a C team, which I guess over in Denver, Colorado Springs, there's a lot more softball teams, and they rate them A, B, or C, and D. And so these guys are league, you know, they, these are the guys that all show up. They have matching um, um, pants and shirts and ball bags, you know, and they're strolling in. These are those guys. And then we show up from Delta, and we barely got matching T-shirts. And, and so we're looking at this chart, and I'm going, well, if they win and we win, and then we would lose, if we would lose here, we wouldn't have to meet them to the championship game. And the best player on the team's looking at me like, what is wrong with you? He's like, why don't we just meet them? He's like, we're as good as they are. Yeah, but you know, they got all the matching stuff. He's like, that doesn't mean they hit. He's like, why don't we just play them and knock them out of the tournament? I don't know. Never occurred to me. I'm trying to avoid them. And, and so I'm like, yeah, let's, let's play them and knock them out of the tournament. Sure, that's a grand idea. I, yeah, I kind of like your idea. So we play, like second game, we're playing. Them. Look, I'm pitching. I'm like, you know, I'm, I'm kind of, I, I, I always prayed in, in the spirit when I pitched. I, I feel that that's probably why people couldn't hit this fat softball because I didn't do anything special. I just, it, it's just like my teammates would say, just throw strikes. Just throw strikes is all a pitcher does in softball. Just throw strikes and don't walk anybody. Well, I wouldn't walk anybody, and I'd throw strikes. And they'd mess up, you know, and... And sometimes the team would get hot and they'd hit a bunch of home runs and then you try to mess, you know, change your pitching a little bit. But you can't do much. It's softball. It's coming in at like five mile an hour. And it's big. So, um, <laughs> so I'm, I'm standing there and I'm just going, oh, wow, here's the team. And I start throwing the ball in and first, first inning, one, two, three, they're out. We go up to bat. And we go up to bat, and our guys are all juiced to play, and, and I, I don't know, the, the inning lasted like 30 minutes. The end of the inning, the score was 26 to nothing. <laughs> and we just played the first inning. We, we, <laughs> we, I think I made two outs in that inning, actually. I was probably one of the worst players on the team, but they had me there because I could pitch. And... Uh, um, it was 26 nothing after the first inning. After the second inning, it was like 32-2. to two. And the third inning, all the wind was out of their sails, and we just kind of exchanged innings for a little bit, and then the game was over. And this frightful D team from, from uh, Colorado Springs got beat like 36-5 to five or something like that. I'm telling you, it's your thinking that matters. Now, I'm just telling you a simple thing. Like, in the grand scheme of things, does, does a sports game matter? No, but it exposed my thinking. It, it exposed where I thought I was, and I'm playing with some guys that actually were very good and were confident in how good they were, and so they thought different. And, and if you notice in life, you bump up against people you find out 
Some people think differently than others. Some people think much bigger than you do. That's why I enjoy hanging out with people, talking to people that have a bigger vision than me. See, if you hang around people that all got small vision, guess what you'll become? You'll have small vision. You hang out with people that want to change the world. And suddenly, you, you, you start believing, I can be part of being a world changer. You know, we went to Turkey the, uh, last year, and we were uh, privileged to be part of some prayer groups and some prayer teams where they specifically stated that, that we're here to pray for countries. Okay, now I, I want you to think about that. When was the last time you prayed for a country? other than the United States. Well, we're not talking about Peggy because she prays for countries. And, but, but generally, most people don't even think of praying for a country. They don't even think about uh, having a country saved. They don't even think about sending people to a country so that a country could be saved. And Scripture tells us, can a country be saved in a day? Right? Can, it, can a country, there is a Scripture verse that says, can a country be saved in one day? Well, if it's up to the Lord, I would assume yes. But it takes people. So I want to be with people that want to change the world. I don't want to be with people that are constantly bickering and fighting and criticizing and thinking about other people. And what they did and how they did it and what and in my opinion they did it wrong. Well, we can get a hundred people in the room and have a hundred opinions on how to do something. And I don't want to hear a hundred opinions. I want to hear of people, I I want to be with people that believe in death and life or in the power of their tongue. And, and, and those who love it will eat its fruit. And, and I, and I want to become something different than the norm. Let's go to Mark chapter 11. We, we, this is really review. Mark chapter 11. Jesus talks about uh, curses the fig tree. And he doesn't curse the fig tree with four-letter words. He doesn't curse a tree like we think a lot of times as cursing. He curses the fig tree by speaking negative. So let me just ask this question. If, if Peter comes running up and he says, the fig tree that you cursed is now withered, and Jesus just spoke negative to the fig tree, is ne speaking negative over things and people, cursing them? Well, he's just a deadbeat, just like his daddy, just like his grandpa, just like his great-grandpa. Yep, she's as stupid as her mother. See, we got to understand that if, if Peter is saying... This fig tree that you cursed has withered away and Jesus, he didn't go bleepity bleep 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 to the fig tree. You bleepity bleep bleep thing, you don't have any fruit. No, he just spoke negative to the fig tree and it was considered a curse. So now look at your life. Where do you speak negative to things or people? And if you find a place where you have been, I mean, it's, it, it just simply repent and simply change and say, you know what? No, I'm going to change my speaking in this area. Our family has learned to correct ourselves uh, in these areas. I can still, I can preach this sermon, I don't know how many times, in the sense of I can still come up many, many, many notches in this, where I still find myself Speaking negative in a situation. Speaking negative. Now, I'm not saying, some people get this confused with, well, do you mean that, if it, that I can't speak truth? No, that's not what I'm talking about. There are times correction needs to be spoken 
which is truth to a person so that they can then change. Okay? But I'm simply speaking over situations, over, and a lot of times it involves our opinions because they did it different than the way we would have done it. And it's just a matter of, of six one way or half a dozen the other. Right? You know, it, it's the same thing. We just would have done it a little different way. Right? And in that, we speak negatively to a situation, and that's something we need to co- correct. Because death and life are in the power of the tongue. And I want life to, if Jesus came in John chapter 10, verse 10, Jesus came to give life and life more abundantly, and I'm supposed to reflect the master, then I want to bring life to situations. See, when I'm being critical of situations and people, I am not bringing life to the situation. You can't bring life and criticize at the same time. You can correct and speak life, but if you're being critical on how they did it, where they did it, what they did, you know, because you know, because you just would have done it so much better. Critical, being critical is a is cursing that person. A critical spirit is not something we should possess. It's something that we need to constantly look at uh, in, in life when you, when you find yourself wanting to correct somebody or if you find yourself um, analyzing another person's life and find yourself saying, well, I would do this differently or I would do this. And one of the questions you should be asking, am I being critical? Is there something about that person that I don't like and, and it's just kind of coming out. Because your, your words are going to work for you, according here to Mark chapter 11. And then Jesus talks about praying, because you speak to your mountain. And then he talks about praying, therefore, when you pray. And we talked about Ephesians chapter 6, praying with the sword, unsheathed, that's praying the word. So now you pray the word over your situation, right? Now you're actually swinging your sword. And a lot of people think the word instead of praying the word. And if you're thinking the word, the the sword's still in your sheath. Now, I'm not saying you can't have any measure of success because we are to renew our minds. But if you want to see a huge difference in your life, speak to your problem. But see, a lot of us want to tell other people about our problem because we want a little bit of pity. Pity isn't godly. Compassion is godly. Pity is not. Some people just want to, want to have another person pity them. And if you jump into that, in, into that um, um, arena with them, you're never going to help them. Because you can't help them with pity. You can help them with compassion. And there's a huge difference. One of the things that um, if, if you find a person or if a friend of yours is pitying themselves or wanting your pity, one of the, uh, the, the, the way you can immediately spot that they're being pity, that they're in this, is if they constantly have a victim mentality. If they cannot take responsibility for their situation, then they're trying to get pity. This this happens in all areas of your life. I don't care uh, what situation, I don't care if you're, you're, you're managing your business, I don't care if you're pastoring a church, I don't care if you're, you're a past, uh, you know, you got a, 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 you're part of the children's ministry upstairs. I don't care if you're at a little Bible study with a bunch of ladies. Uh, one thing that I've always appreciated about my wife, and I'll shout this from the rooftop, is um, when she would go to girls' night out, some people think, well, we just have to have girls' night out or guys' night out. And Kim attended a few of them. She came back from that, and she said, I'll never have to go again. 
I'm like, why? What's the deal? Well, all they do is get together and talk about their husbands. And she's like, that's not what I do. And, and part of that, and that in of itself is, is a victim mentality because we're going to get together and we can all have pity together because of how evil our husbands are and they're not cutting the butter on the, where we want them to. See, it's not anything, I mean, I would surely never change. It's all his fault. See, when you're constantly talking about uh, where if you keep running up against this in life, then maybe you need to look at yourself where you're constantly dealing where it's always the employee's fault. It's always the uh, other person's fault. It's always the wife's fault. It's always the husband's fault. It's always the other person. You know what? What if it's you? What if you're the, I mean, wouldn't you be the common denominator here? Anybody remember how to do co common denominators in math class? Right? And you, and, and you divide and divide and divide. And the common, denator, common denominator is me. What if I'm the problem? See, if I stay victim, I can't take responsibility. Sure, there is at times things that seem out of your control. But if you take the victim road, you'll, you'll never snap out of it. Because you're always going to be pointing at it's the other person. It's the other company. It's, it's the other pastor. See, that's why people change churches all the time. They've been hurt by a pastor and... You know, some of you have been church hurt by pastors. I've been church hurt by pastors. Kim and I couldn't get married by our pastors. And 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 that boy, when they when they know they got you, because you know you got a common goal, you want to get married. They the, the, and they know it. They'll make you jump through every hoop there possibly is. And there was five things we needed to do for them to marry us. Retake our, our wedding pictures, and I don't remember the others. Or not our engagement pictures. I don't even remember the other four. One of them was to, I think, maybe attend church for six months straight without missing one service, and on and on and on. And I told them that I'm not going to do that. And so we had to find somebody else to marry us. And, and so I know what it's like to be church hurt myself. So some people go, well, Jay, you just don't understand. No, I understand. I wanted to lynch him. I wasn't very godly at the time either. And I would have enjoyed it, pretty sure. But see, these are things, taking a, the, the, the victim road is not going to help you. Taking ownership and responsibility of your life is the first step for you to get free. See, when you begin to confess with your mouth, because life and death are in the power of your tongue, and you begin to confess with your mouth, you know what? I could have done better. I had to uh, really learn this in, in, in uh, running my businesses. Somebody drops the ball. I don't know how many times I made assumptions that another company was going to do what they said that they were going to do. And they were going to follow through and have things for me on time because they said. And so I figured if they said, and I hold my word, then we got a good deal. But I found out that a lot of companies don't operate always the same way I do. And then the day before our deadline, I'd make phone calls. and They're like, oh, no, we're still a week out or we're two weeks out. Now I'm upset. And I'm like, well, you dropped the ball. What's wrong with you? You know, it's not my fault. And, and I began to learn, okay, how do I come from a place of responsibility in this, in this picture? I can chew them out, spit them out, stump on them, get angry. Does that get me my product quicker? <laughs> You're very smart. 
I wasn't the, always that smart. So I could yell, scream, because I had people yelling and screaming at me. That was not my fault. Right? Or I learned I could take ownership. Say, so you know what? I apologize. I should have called you a week ago and made sure we were on schedule. And then I could have called you three days ago and made sure we were on schedule so that it's not a surprise now on this day that we don't have the product because I was constantly checking in. doesn't mean that I'm worried, but I'm checking in from 10 days ago to seven days ago to four days ago, and we are well-versed on exactly when this product's going to show up. And then I can communicate to my superiors because my superiors were looking at me saying, Jay, you said, you said you're going to be done by this weekend. I'm like, well, I don't even have the stuff. That doesn't fly in Aspen. <laughs> They're like, we don't care what you said. You said you're going to be done. And, and you learn to take ownership instead of playing the victim. Going into the job trailer in Aspen and going, you know, it's not really my fault. They'll kick you out of the job trailer and say, we paid you to get the job done. We don't care. We don't care if it's your fault. We don't care if it's their fault. You said you'd be done June the 15th, so we expect it finished. There was times I went back to the hotel, and I just prayed in tongues. Because I'm like, I don't know how, I don't know how to get this done. Like, like the pressure of the job and getting these things figured out, it's like I, I don't have a clue how to maneuver or operate, but God does. And I'm telling you, we had miracle after miracle of things arriving just in time, getting things done, but also coming from a place of responsibility help me instead of making excuses. See, your words matter. Your words matter. See, now, let's, let's go to where I wanted to go today, tonight. I know we only got 15 minutes. 1 Corinthians 13. See, if you don't come from a place of responsibility in life, it's going to be impossible for you to walk in love. Got a resounding amen on that. If you don't come from a place of responsibility, it will be impossible for you to walk in love. Let's read what the love walk actually is. Chapter 13, verse 1. It says, Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels. So, when Scripture says, they spoke in other tongues, it apparently includes angelic languages. But here he's saying, let's say I'm the biggest tongue talker there is. I speak in the tongues of men and of angels. A lot of people would look at me and say, wow, he's quite the holy dude. He's got speaking in tongues down. But I have not love. What am I? What am I? So a week ago, I brought up, you know, um, you can take, now these you can't because they're rubber. They changed them. But you take the old uh, drum sets and take those two cymbals together. And if somebody would sneak up behind you and have two of them and think it's a joke and they're going to try to scare you, and they're like, bam. And you jump and they go, ha, 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 ha. You probably have some choice words and think maybe they're a sounding brass or a clanging cymbal. <laughs> right? You'd be like, what's wrong with you? If you don't have love, you can speak with all kinds of tongues of men, of angels, different languages, angelic languages, amazing stuff, but have not love, I've become sounding brass or a clanging cymbal. Verse 2. And though I have the gift of prophecy. Oh, prophecy. 
We got somebody come up here and prophetically speak over the church, prophetically speak over you. They got an amazing prophecy that changes your life. They got prophecy for the country, for your state. They just got the gift of prophecy flowing. They make you feel like you're a nobody. They got super S on their, their, their chest. I mean, they are super Christians. But though I have the gift of prophecy, I understand all mysteries and all knowledge and have all faith so that I could remove mountains. I mean, they're just, they're mountains. They don't even have mountains. They speak to their stuff, boom, comes a plane. They don't have problems. They just floating through life, but they don't have love. What do they got? Nothing. Is this word? Is this scripture? Can you be super spiritual on Saturday nights and Sunday mornings and be nothing? Yeah. That's what it says. Verse 3. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor. Well, we just had a good, great tithe message about tithing and offerings and giving and how it's necessary and you guys ought to do it and, and, and how awesome it is and how great it is. Ah, uh, you give everything away. Feed the poor. You're down here at the uh, homeless shelter every week. And you're feeding them. You're cooking for them. You're doing great works for them. Though I give my body to be burned. Well, you're burned at the stake. I mean, we have martyr's mirror about that thick. Some people want to put it above the Bible or on top of the Bible, glorify how amazing those martyrs were. Right here it says, though I give my body to be burned. I'm martyred, but have not love. What does it profit me? Nothing. It doesn't even profit a little bit. It doesn't say it profits you slightly. No, you can go through all this stuff that we would call Super Christian, super ass, big ass, you're amazing, you're wonderful, you, you're pastor material, you're leader material, you're this material, you're amazing, you're, you're life, whew, I mean, you are called, you are anointed. You're nothing. Verse 4. Love suffers long. Now, what I've learned and... Um, have done many times. I encourage you to do it. When you are having issues with loving somebody, when you're having problems, because loving a person is not a feeling. See, we got to get past where, well, I get along with that person, so I love them. No, 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 no. That's not love. That's just a feeling. Love is a choice. I have committed myself, and I'm choosing to love this person. A lot of times, they're going to probably be unlovely, <laughs> unloving. And, and what I've found happens, I've, I've, I've found a couple things in life. I've found that most Christians don't know how to walk in love. Probably because maybe it's not taught enough. Most people don't know that it's a choice that you have to choose. It's when you're not getting along. It's when things aren't working out. Yeah, that, that's when this operates. Then you come here, and what I've found helps me, because death and life are in the power of the tongue, is to take the word love out, because what we've got to understand is I now have Jesus in me, Right? The Holy Spirit's on me. It's empowered me. Jesus is in me. So I have the fruit of the Spirit on the inside of me, don't I? So that means I have love. So I then am becoming love. It may not have manifested perfectly in, in, in my life yet, but, but it's there. So for me to come here and begin and take the word love out and put my name in there. Jay suffers long and is kind. Yeah, but what if they're idiots all day? Jay suffers long and is kind. Now, you're not going to say Jay suffers long and is kind. You're going to put your name in there. 
I'm glad you're praying for me, but you're going to be praying for you, yourself. So if you're saying it, it's your name in here. Jay suffers long in his kind. Sometimes I've found, I've been, I've been in my work truck at lunchtime. I distinctly remember being in Aspen at a job site. I was so mad. I went out there and I kept, a, I kept a, my first King James Bible that, right, that I had when I first got spirit filled. And I kept that in my truck. Had the cover torn off, but it had the rest in there. I had this chapter in there. And I'd go out to my truck and I'd open my, my, my Bible. And I'd just start saying this. Jay suffers long in his kind. Jay does not envy. Jay does not parade itself. Is not puffed up. Verse 5. Jay does not behave rudely. Jay does not seek his own. Jay is not provoked. Jay thinks no evil. I'm telling you, the enemy will bombard you and what you think the other person's actually thinking, and a lot of it's not true. You're not going to think evil. Yeah, but they have this motive. I'm not going to think that. I don't know. Jay does not rejoice in iniquity. Jay rejoices in the truth. Jay bears all things. Jay believes all things. Jay hopes all things. Jay endures all things. Verse 8. Jay never fails. Never fails. Yeah, but they're so unlovely. They are so unloving. I don't know. I don't can't process how to love them. See, you have to get past the thinking in your head and make the choice in your heart. See, the choice, it's not whether you can think through this and realize it's not going to fail. No. You make the choice before you've thought through. But whether there are prophecies, they will fail. Whether there are tongues, they will cease. Whether there is knowledge, it will vanish away. But love, J, never fails. See, now you're using the word as your weapon. Now you got your sword out of your sheath. You're not thinking this. You're actually looking to become this. This person was an idiot, and you're over here going, Jay, you're, gonna lo- you're going to love that person. If you haven't ever taken your ear with your hand and said, Jay, you will love that person whether you feel like it or not, I haven't faced that unlovely of a person yet. Now, maybe you didn't physically do that, but you kind of did it in your head. In other words, you were going, Jay, get yourself together. You will choose love. Because love never fails. Love never fails. I mean, think about that. How many times is love going to work? How many times? Always. It never fails. Again, I'm not talking about love being some icky, gushy, oh, I got to hug somebody, love. Sometimes love means to speak very pointedly in their life. But love never fails. I, I used to come to this chapter and just meditate on it because this is where the energy and the anger would leave. Because you're going, if I operate in love, if I am love, Jesus is in me, I'm in Jesus, I'm operating in love, it never fails. Yeah, but they've been mean to me for a year. Love never fails. It never fails. I don't care if it's five years from now do they figure it out. I don't care if it's ten years from now do they figure it out. I don't care if they don't figure it out in this lifetime. Life, love never fails. So for me to respond in love, it never fails. 
I can sit here and stand here and preach on faith till I'm blue in the face. If we do not love when, when we're believing, faith's not going to work for us. Let's finish with Mark chapter 11. Let's go back there. Why do you think, Je- I mean, Jesus knew it. Jesus knew it. For assuredly, verse 23, I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be removed, be cast into the sea, does not doubt in his heart, but believes that those things he says will be done. He will have whatever he says. Amazing verse. Awesome verse. Speak to your mountain. Whatever your mountain is, speak to it. Speak right at it. That's what he says to do. He doesn't say cry out to the Lord and the Lord will remove the mountain. He says speak to your mountain. So you find your mountain in your life, speak to it. Tell it it's supposed to operate the way it's supposed to operate. Speak to your body. If, if there's something on your body, speak to your body. Speak to the rash. Curse your rash. You can curse the bad things in your life. And I don't mean a four-letter word. Oh, pastor gave me permission to go around and go bleepity bleep bleep. No, that's not what I mean. I mean curse as in speaking negative. Like, die already. If there's something on you that shouldn't be, speak to it and say, die, get off my body. You're not supposed to be on my body. Speak to your, mount, uh, to your mountain. And he says right here, there's three times he says, if you say, and only one time does he say believe. So we can get excited. We're jumping up and down. We're faith people. <coughs> this, this works for us. This is wonderful. Verse 24. Therefore I say to you, whatever things you ask when you pray, believe that you receive them, you will have them. Oh, great verse. Wonderful verse. Everybody shouts. Everybody jumps. Everybody says, oh, what a wonderful sermon, Pastor. But we forget the next. Verse 25. And whenever you stand praying, if you have anything against anyone. Now, that sounds pretty clear. If you have anything against anyone. If somebody rubbed you the wrong way. If somebody's just really great. In your, I mean, it's just, uh, forgive him. Forgive them. Forgiveness doesn't mean you're their best friend. Forgiveness is simply saying, you know, whatever that icky feeling is between me and that person, I release them. I let it go. I don't have to be right. I don't have to be the good guy. I don't have to be anything. I'm just, just release it. So that your Father in heaven may forgive you your trespasses. In other words, if you refuse forgiveness, <coughs> you cannot walk in love. In other words, if you say, no, I'm not going to forgive that person because they, they deserved every punishment they can get. As if your punishment of, <laughs> I mean, just think about how funny this sounds. You're going to give them the cold shoulder. They didn't even miss you. I'm going to remove my presence from them. They didn't even know you were gone. I'm going to punish them uh, by not talking to them. They were probably like, woohoo, glory. It's about time. <laughs> like, like, like you're going to punish them. Like, like it, but this is, how, this is how people think. I've thought these thoughts. You've thought these thoughts. You, I'm going to avoid them. Husbands, avoid their wife. Wives, avoid their husband. Don't talk about certain issues or things in their marriage because we're just, we're just not going to, we're going to punish them. And it goes on for three days and seven days and two weeks and a month and they're trying to punish each other and it's like, you're not getting anywhere. You're not walking in love. And, and where you got to get to in life 
is you cannot afford to be here because it will affect your talking, your speaking, and it'll affect your faith. If you're not getting answers for something that you're believing God for by faith, ask the Holy Spirit, is there something I have not forgiven somebody for? Is there a place I am not walking in love? Because if you love a person, your faith will work for you. Life's too short for me not to love. If somebody does, if somebody speaks out against me and criticizes me, you know what? I, I kind of find it interesting that I'm important enough for them to criticize. I mean, there was a couple years ago that I wasn't. <laughs> and I'm just like, wow, they actually took the time. They actually, you know, and, and some people come up to me, did you hear what somebody said? And I'm like, no, I don't want to hear it. I don't want to hear it. But do you know what they said about you? No, I, I don't know, and I, and I don't want to deal with the negative thoughts, so please don't tell me. Don't, don't even tell me. Because I don't want to deal with the bombardment of thoughts that I'm going to have, so it's better that I don't know. So please don't tell me. Sometimes your friends get a little upset because they really want to tell you. And you've got to be like, you've got to get adamant about, no. You do not tell me that. I would have problems. If you'd be my friend, you would try to protect me and, not, and, and, and purposely not tell me that. You just, you just want to look good in my eyes or look good in your own eyes or whatever it is. It's a little like I was reading about David here and <laughs> all the idiots that would come running to David to tell him how Saul died. They kept lying. So David killed him. Because they wanted to look good in David's eyes. Like, ooh, the king's going to do something. So, so... You know, the one guy says, well, I drew my sword and I killed Saul. And David's like, you killed Saul? Sick him. Kill that guy. So he's dead because he wanted to be glorified. Let's stand to our feet. Faith doesn't work without love. I hope that you learn some things tonight. Check some things in your life. Review if there's things you've been believing for and things haven't been happening. The story I, I told you tonight about <laughs> somebody offering to pay for a garage door. came directly from some people that criticized us very, very harshly. And Kim and I knew it. And we just said, we're going to choose love. Because love doesn't fail. And we're, we're just, we're, we're just going to, we're here and we're going to love them. Even if they hate us. Even if they despise us, we're going to love them. We had no agenda. We had no idea God's going to turn it around to bless us. We just simply were like, our house is going to walk in love. And they can say whatever they want to say. It's not going to affect us. Because we're going to walk in love. And we're going to speak life to them every chance we have. And we did. Now, that's, I'm not just telling you this to glorify us. I'm telling you this because it's a testimony of what walking in love can do. And sometimes the very people that speak against you turn around, and then they're for you later. And you're like, only God can do that because love never fails. Father, I thank you for each person here tonight. I thank you that their walk of faith is continuing to grow and expand. And Father, tonight you've shown them areas they can improve in their love walk. 
Father, give them the strength. Give them the grace to walk in love. Let them discern what is love and what's fake. A big smile and a big hug doesn't mean love. And Father, help them understand what is true love and how they can they can get to a place where they can have compassion for the person. Because when compassion happens, when when because we're concerned about the per, the person and and their their um, their well being. Father, help each person and give them that grace. In the mighty name of Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Well, Kim and I are going to be headed out tomorrow. Pray for us. We're going to be at the Landmark. I believe Lee and Joyce are going to be there. We're going to have an amazing week. We're going to have a week that we're going to get filled up to a new level with the Holy Spirit. We're going to miss some of you guys, some of you guys that have gone for the last couple of years. Uh, but I know that there's a season and time for some of this. So um, we're going to have a great time. And um, don't be jealous uh, because one of the things I didn't announce earlier, but we're really looking at having a landmark here in Colorado in October. So that's just a couple months away. And we're, we're, and we're wanting to announce it while we're in there. It's going to be up to Dale, Pastor Dale, on, on when and how. But uh, we're hoping that that gets announced, that we're going to have it here probably the first week in October. And I'm looking forward to it already. And um, all of you that weren't able to go will be able to plug into that, to the anointing. And, um, yeah, yeah. Uh, Get Bob and Dale and John and Sydney, Pastor Sydney, and and a few others all in the same place, and and uh, stuff happens. <laughs> so rejoice um, if you're not going. Uh, stay in love, stay in faith, and we're believing for them to come uh, here, and we can enjoy them here. So glory to God. That's where we're going to be this week, and we're looking forward to it. Hallelujah. You're dismissed.